Uh, this is going to be a little more esoteric than you're probably used to because I'm, I'm a computational chemist. I'm a professor at TCU. I do new materials design. And so this is a really cool area that, that a lot of people in the material science world have been working on for the last 20 years. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about prospects for turning polymers into semiconducting devices. The few, explain how they work how you can actually get a plastic to conduct electricity, do a little bit of solid state physics because that's what I do, so you'll have to put up with it, and a little bit about some real devices, and finally about what we're trying to work towards to use these things for collecting solar energy. So next slide, please. Uh, yeah, next slide. Okay, so we're working with plastics, basically. Yeah, that's a bad idea. So, Plastics, and I knew I didn't have to bring any examples because we have these things all over the place, are, I'm, I'm a chemist and so I tend to think about these things on a very small scale. So plastics, polymers, are really just long chains of atoms bound together. Polyethylene, which I think is what this stuff is, is just carbon and hydrogen atoms bound together into big long chains. And if you look at them, these are microstructures, this length, this length bar is about one micron, or a thousandth of a millimeter. If you look at it, it looks sort of like spaghetti all packed together. Next slide, please. And the neat thing is, you can make these things into semiconductors. So most modern electronics are based on inorganic semiconductors. I'll talk a little bit about what that means, but it's, it's silicon, it's got some other atoms into it. You put a metal, evaporate metal electrodes on top of it, and you get a device. Well, they work really well. Silicon-based electronics work great. They tend to be expensive. They tend to be brittle. It's hard to cover really large areas. You can imagine if you wanted to make... So the, the analogy that I use is a, a solar panel is sort of the equivalent of a three-meter square computer chip. That's exaggerating a little bit, but not too much. So this is one reason why these things are expensive. Oops, sorry. Oh, previous slide? Oh, sorry. No problem. My, My bad. <laughs> So if you could make cheap and flexible electronics, you could use them for a lot of things. And maybe you could even get away with, you know, cheap and flexible electronics that are not as nice, not as highly conductive, not as regular as regular silicon, because you can get away with some level of error. So of course, if you want to make something cheap, you make it out of plastic. Next slide. So we've been working on these semiconducting polymers. Now, I should I'll talk about how these things work, but the trick is there's no metal added. There's no silicon added. It's just plain old organic chemistry, plain old plastics that happen to act as semiconductors. So to explain this, we have to talk a little bit about quantum mechanics. But it's really, once you get past the basic idea that quantum mechanics actually works and actually models the world, the, 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 the thinking behind it is easy. I'm a chemist, not a physicist, so I'm sort of, I'm sort of dumb. So if I can understand it, you, you kind of can too. So we'll talk about a real example. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Next one. Okay. okay, so this is something that you all know much more about than I do. If you want to build a field effect transistor, this is something that's got a source electrode, a drain electrode, a gate electrode. You can tune the conductivity of the source drain channel by adjusting the gate voltage. Well, if you look at this thing in detail, there's an n-type semiconductor, a semiconductor that conducts negative electrons. The bulk of the material is this p-type semiconductor that conducts positive charge charges. There's a gate and an oxide, and this channel right here, the number of electrons passing through this channel gets tuned by your gate voltage, and that's how the device works. Next slide, please. So, we're going to talk about energy level diagrams of these things, but before we talk about that, we have to talk about quantum mechanics. So, if you ever took freshman chemistry, or if you took chemistry in middle school, they may have talked about this picture. But this is a cartoon of how a chemist thinks about a silicon atom. So, this is a plot of an energy scale. The little arrows are electrons, and the lines are what we call allowed energy levels. Now, the quantum behind quantum mechanics is that if I take a silicon atom, and I put a bunch of electrons on it. Well, those electrons can't do whatever they want. They can't be at whatever energy they want. They're at these quantized 
allowed energy levels. One of the things that this gives us is it gives us the fact that um, there's only allowed, there's only certain allowed energy differences here. So if we take this electron, if we take this silicon atom and we shine light on it, and we shine light that happens to have, where each photon of light has the same energy as this energy difference, well, we can get an excitation. We can get the reverse effect, too. If I take a gas of silicon atoms, which you can prepare if you just heat it up enough, and I heat it real high so that some of these high energy levels are populated, the electrons falling back down into the low levels emit light. And so if you get something like, this is done a lot if you have, say, neon tubes. So with a, with a container of neon gas, you, you put a bunch of neon in a tube, you shoot electrons through to excite the electrons inside the neon, and then when they fall back down, they emit light of a certain color. They emit photons of a certain energy. And so this quantization is why you can have, why a neon tube is whatever color it is, blue or red, or it depends on what gas you put in, why they don't all glow bright white, why they don't all glow with all the colors at once. Because quantum mechanics works. Now, of course, electron, inter electron interactions complicate this simple picture, and my job is dealing with those complications and trying to model them. But, so, if I've got you to the point where you believe that quantum mechanics works, that electrons sit in atoms, next slide, now we start moving towards semiconductors. If I put two silicon atoms together, here's one on the left, here's one on the right, and I do all the quantum mechanics to figure out what these levels are, well, they shift, they mix together. And the, when they mix, they typically end up giving me a bunch of new low energy levels. I'd fill up my electrons that were in this atom and were in this atom, put them in these new levels. Now my total energy is lower. And so I have a stable silicon-silicon bond. Next slide, please. Uh, yes. So, sorry to interrupt, but do, do you mean like if I need, uh, what, what, what is the unit of this energy? One quanta is uh, it's, to move uh, away from one level to the next? It, uh, one plank, let's yeah, in, in... So, wh whatever it is, are you saying that because I have two silicon atoms, now I have an in-between, so the difference between level two level is half? Uh, it's not quite half. So th this, diff this splitting, which in silicon, at in silicon is around, um, say, uh, visible photon energy. Mm -hmm. That splitting depends on the structure of the material. And so for, for something like silicon, I take two silicon atoms, they form a really strong bond, and I get a really strong splitting. Something like neon, two neon at atoms don't really form much of a chemical bond, so the splitting is really tiny. But this is the, the same qualitative picture occurs for all systems. But in essence, the difference from one level to the next is smaller than if, didn't, if I didn't have the bond. Right, right. Okay, next slide. So what happens now is if I take a macroscopic number of silicon atoms, I make a device, then all of those little energy levels all mix together to form bands. And I get, if, if you've ever taken solid state physics, you see that I get these bands of energies that are, allowed energies that are full. My electron, can have, my electron in my block of silicon can basically have energy, any energy in here. I have a band of empty states. My electron can sit in any one of these empty states anywhere inside this band. And now if I absorb light, well, I can get an excited electron up in this high energy band, positive charge left over in this low energy band. And the important part of semiconductors is that because of the way the hybridization works, because of the way the levels mix together, and just because of what we see in reality, there's this forbidden space. There's this set of bands that, the, there's this set of energies that the electrons can't have. And so this is the thing that makes a semiconductor different from a metal. Next slide, please. So to sum up, 30 seconds of solid state physics, hybridization of many atoms broadens the allowed energies into bands. Metals, you can have an electron in a metal can have any energy at once. So you can take an electron, excite it just a little tiny bit, and now it can move around through the device, and it works as a really good conductor. It's a little, slightly, highly, slightly higher energy than usual electrons in a metal can fuse around, so it's a great conductor. Non-metals, not so much. You always have this forbidden region, this band gap, which is why these things work as devices, and now we're going to talk about next how you use these band gaps to build an actual field effect transistor. Excited states, which we're going to care about a lot when we talk about photovoltaics later on, are represented as electron hole pairs. 
And next slide, please. And question yes, go ahead. Um, on that slide, um, that the uh, the you use the word virtual bands contrasted with oc occupy oh. bands. Does the virtual carry any connotations? Uh, it's 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 there for historical reasons. It's bands that are not occupied if everything's sitting in the ground state okay. and you can excite okay. them if you shine light on them. I see. Yeah. Okay, so next slide. So back to our field effect transistor. Now, this is a semiconductor. This is a semiconductor. This has uh, various allowed <coughs> bands that are my electrons can sit in, various allowed energies that my electrons can have. This has a different continuum of energies that my electrons can have. And I can use that to build an actual device. Next slide, please. Here's the same device, but now drawn in one of these band structures. The x-axis is a slice through the device. Here's my drain electrode, here's my n-type semiconductor, my p-type in the middle, my n-type, and my source electrode. I'm not showing the gate voltage just yet, the y-axis is the energy. My drain electrode is a metal, my electrons can have any energy they want. My drain semiconductor, has a filled band and an empty band. Source, source has the same filled and empty bands, but now this bit in the middle is a little different. It's a different kind of semiconductor, so it has different bands. And so if I take a, this electrode, hook it up to a battery, inject an electron into this device, well, it's not going to transfer from here to here. It's got this barrier. It's got to jump up over this barrier, go to these high energies, and come back down. And so in the absence of anything else, I'm not going to see a lot of conduction between my source and drain electrodes in this picture. Next slide, please. And now what I do is when I apply my gate voltage to this guy, I inject some extra positive charge into it. That stabilizes the electrons inside the device, changes the curvature of my bands, and increases my conductivity. So now you know how a field effect transistor works. So. That's, you know, five minutes of solid state physics, how all these devices that we're actually using work. And the reason I told you about that is so that I can tell you about how we're going to try and make all these different parts of this thing out of plastic. Next slide, please. So what about conductive polymers? Conductive polymers, or you can think of this being like a one-dimensional metal or a one-dimensional semiconductor. Here's my cartoon of a single polymer chain, this is actually polyacetylene. So I have a polymer chain made of these tightly bound carbon hydrogen atoms. And then each CH group has an extra electron that sits in this extra orbital. This is a picture of the orbital. If I, I'll show you later the energy level diagrams, just like I did for the semiconductor. But these extra electrons, these um, energy levels can hybridize together. Next slide, please. And we get something that looks like this. Here's all my extra electrons. Each site looks the same. Each site has a single um, electron on it. They mix together. They form new bands. And so this device looks just like my silicon. It has these semi. It has these hybridized semiconducting bands. And so I have something that acts like a one-dimensional semiconductor. Next slide, please. And so we can make these things. And people have been making these things for 20 years. There was a Nobel Prize about it, all this other wonderful stuff. So there's polyacetylene, there's this polythiophene, polyphenylene, vinylene, these are all things that chemists, words that chemists care about. But all of them are polymer chains that have these conjugated, um, as drawn by these double bonds. I, I guess I, those of you who don't know any chemistry, um, which You'll have to excuse me because <laughs> I'm so you. This is so much our language of drawing these little cartoons that I forget that not everyone thinks about the world this way. <laughs> but the important part is the the, the, the take-home message is that all of these polymers, all of these plastics that we can make in the lab, act like one-dimensional semiconductors, and we so can clump them all together and let them all tangle and coil up and form yes devices. How do, the, how do those band gap voltages compare to silicon band gap voltages? Silicon's about one point, they're, they're about the same. Silicon's oh. about 1.6, yeah. if I remember correctly. So these, these mm -hmm. band gaps are, uh, so this one is green light. So if you make poly 3 alkyl thiopene, it'll actually absorb green light and blue light, which is going to be important later on. Next slide, please. 
So, one of the things that I think a lot about is once we've made these things, how do we make them into a device? So you can't make a practical device without processing the material. So what we end up doing is we end up trying to build these polymers. Uh, go back to the previous slide, please. Okay. Yeah. What, yeah, so one of the problems that we run into is this sort of rigid conductive chain, the part that acts like a semiconductor, doesn't bend around and curl very much. So it's tough to get it off into solution. So we put these sort of long, non-conjugated alkyl chains, just a bit of an insulator that will sort of flop around hanging off the end of this polymer chain. And that will help the thing go into solution. And so you can take this stuff, dissolve it in organic solvent. Next slide, please. Drop it onto a surface and get a film of conductive polymer deposit. The trouble is that the device properties strongly depend on the structure and the crystal packing of the depositing polymer. So we, we need some work on that, but there's some interesting things that we can do there. Next slide, please. Excuse me. Yes. Going back to that. Okay, I'm just trying to look at this as a typical maker. Okay, you know, you know I've got toluene, i got acetone. I've got poly, you know, polyethylene bags, you know. Yes. That, so, and I can probably, you know, stick some of those bags in toluene and make a mess. The question <laughs> I have is, is can I spread that out on a glass plate and make a film, and would I be able to do anything with it? We'll call part. Now, well, let let me answer your question in two ways. Okay. The first is sort of the big picture answer, which is that. This stuff, there's going to be a few examples of this stuff that you can buy, but it's still new technology. Mm -hmm. So this is sort of, was originally going to be a talk about stuff that you, you, we can start thinking about using in real projects now, maybe think more about in the future, just keep in mind. The second, more specific answer is that this stuff doesn't conduct electricity. Right. I, I, I know that. Yes, of course. Of course. Yeah. So the question, I, the question I was just wondering is, okay. So what I'm trying to get at is, as a maker, we would love to have some sort of experiment that we could see the effect. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be very efficient. It doesn't have to be. But it just has to, you know, something that we could actually see the effect. Is there? Something using homegrown materials that we could get that we could get get hold of. Like for example, the acetate is available everywhere, and we have scraps of acetate all over the floor right right now because that's where the laser cutter was. The question is: is can we can we do anything that, uh, or do you have to dope these too? Well, uh, I, I'm that's just, that's something. That's a good question, and the answer is no one's done it yet. Okay. The answer, that, well, the answer, the answer is that no, as far as I know, there, there's no non-university associated group that's been able to do much of anything with conductive polymers. So if we, if you do that, you'll be the first. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So do, do I understand that this isn't actually your average polyethylene? Yes. It's got an extra electron that you put in somehow through some kind of magic. It's it's, it's the way you make the plastic. So it's like there's there's polystyrene, there's polyethylene, there's all these different kinds of plastic that you can make. Well, these are another different kind of plastic. Okay. Well, then How do you get the extra electron in? Uh, it, it shows up there naturally. So the, the, the short answer would be that's just what happens when you make the polymer. It just stays bound there. The longer answer, go back one slide. Back one, back. Okay, so, so these little... So if I took this thing and each of these sites I added an extra hydrogen atom, so an extra hydrogen nucleus and an extra electron. Then I would get polyethylene. So this is polyethylene with one hydrogen atom removed from each carbon, or one hydrogen gas molecule removed from, from each carbon, from each pair of carbons. And so you do that by doing chemistry. I think, yes, I, I, think how I, know, I think I know how to repose the question. So, like, if we go to semiconductors, clearly nobody in here is going to try to assemble their own semiconductor lab at home because you would need really? millions of dollars <laughs> worth of it. Actually, actually, if you go out exactly on, on Hackaday, <laughs> you'll find several cases where people have made their own semiconductors at home using pretty much garage-type stuff. 
Okay, so how can we do yeah. the plastic thing at home yeah. using garage stuff? Well, I'm, I'm just what I'm trying to now. What I'm pushing you for mm -hmm. is is that uh, people will try this if. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and uh, I mean, you're the chemist. Let me give you an, <laughs> let me give you an example. <laughs> About two years ago, a material called Shugu or S U G U hit the hit 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 a kind of the maker area and it's basically a moldable silicon rubber okay and everybody was making knobs out of it and everything but it's very you know you could buy a little packet and it's sold for like two dollars so it was very expensive and but if you go now on instructables you can show how to take silicon caulking and uh, I think you use I think you use starch as the binder and you know he makes the stuff you can make the stuff at home for you know pennies so there's an example of where how the maker community thinks okay <laughs> I mean, you know it's there's something I want and I can't get it and they'll mess around until they can find it. Well I guess the question is how yeah. complicated is the process to make let's say this polyacetylene and is it, does it involve like a lot of high temperatures a lot of exotic Organic uh, compounds it, it, and 50 it, it, steps, it, it, or is it, it can in, it can involve either electrochemical. Well, let me let me step back. I might not be the best person to ask because I'm a theorist. I don't make this stuff myself. I just think about how it works. Mm -hmm. okay. But some of these things can be made by electrochemical polymerization. So you can take something like um, like purity and hook some electrodes up to it. I think you can make a conductive polypyridine without too much difficulty if you're willing to work with high voltages. The other thing that we're, we're going to talk about is there are a couple of conductive inks that are starting to come on the market. Yeah. But my, my focus so far has really been on the fundamentals of understanding these things and then leaving it up to others. <laughs> other sort of people to make them into practical devices. But, you know, we have to, we have to start somewhere. Yes? Uh, you said on the uh, polyeth... Oh, the top one. Mm -hmm. That... <laughs> 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 you yeah, okay, can't yeah. pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah. You can't make it. No, I'm just teasing. Um, <laughs> then with, uh, on, with an extra hydrogen in the... attached to the carbon between the loops, that that's then polyethylene. Yeah. How is, if it could have the extra hydrogen there, how is it stable in this state? Is that kind of what I'm asking? Uh, it's, okay, so that's, that's an exa that's a specific example of the broader, of the broader, ex broader question of how are two different kinds of molecules, how can two different kinds of molecules be stable? Basically, this is sort of the reverse of a combustion reaction. So, it, it's a hydrogenation reaction. So what that means is, well, we have this material, and then we have the lower energy polyethylene. But to get from one to the other, you have to go over an energy barrier. It's the same thing of if I take this piece of plastic sitting here, and plastic and paper and whatnot, sitting in an oxygen atmosphere. It's stable, but the lower energy state is where this thing burns and forms carbon dioxide and water but it'll still sit around and be stable because you have to go over some activation there. Basically, just like normal plastics, all these things will catch on fire pretty readily and they'll burn pretty nicely. Does that answer your question? No. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Maybe you can ask it a, a um, Carbon bonds with four things. Yeah, this Generally, is, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, so it looks like it's bonded with three there. Correct. How? Double bonds. Double carbon, oh, carbon, sure. carbon double bonds. Okay. That hybridize together to with form the, sort of with the hydrogen chains. or with the with one side of the carbon chain. Or? With this this carbon being doubly bound to that one. Okay. This carbon being doubly bound to that one. Okay. And so then, if you throw in the additional hydrogen, that bond is then weakened. Yeah, as it's, a it's of broken. Hydrogen. It's you break a carbon. You turn a carbon. Well, but carbon. you're taking a double bond, just alternating it for a single bond. Right. Okay. Yes. Just taking your thought, okay, so where you showed the paper cup, which was mm -hmm. stable, and there would have to be energy added, otherwise typically heat, which would 
turn it into, you know, its components of carbon and whatever. It would, it would burn. Be, yeah, it would be a chemical reaction. Right, right. Okay. So, if you melted this stuff, or not this, the polypropylene, if you melted it and you captured the gases off of that, would that form some of this stuff? Uh, my understanding is no. My understanding is that the you have to do something else to drive the chemistry towards making it. Because okay. so, well, I was wondering if you put a piece of polypropylene, which would have the original state, and then you, and like I say, you have your burnt polypropylene, and it would, would, it, would it use that as a uh, substrate and give you a modified? Because it wouldn't have the same energy. Uh, I think that you would get other side reactions occurring that gave you other carbonaceous crud. Well, like I said, we didn't, we're good at making messes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Perfectly reasonable term. Yeah. Okay, so next one. Next one. And, uh, yeah, okay. I, I, this is where we were, I think. Yeah, yeah. So, so this is just more about the theory and more about how we have to make these things. Well, one of the things that's important is these are actual pictures of this polyalkyl thiamine. The scale bar is 100 nanometers. If you have short chains, they pack into something that looks like this. If you have long chains, they sort of spaghetti it together into something that looks like that. Uh, one of our projects is trying to fig trying to understand the model, the synthesis of these things in a way that you can make short chains rather than long chains because this device has a bunch of insulating little places in the mid. All the dark spots are insulated, so this is pretty low conductivity. This, even though it looks messier, is a higher conductivity. Next slide. So why are you going, trying to go for shorter chains if the higher conductivity We're is trying to go for longer chains. Oh, okay. okay. My mistake. Okay. I Sorry. just make sure. You. Okay, so now a little more about what devices are out there for this. Like I said, there are some conductive polymer inks on the environment, or on the market, excuse me. I don't know about buying these in small quantities, but this is the sort of thing that you could use if you wanted to, you know, put some conductive ink into an inkjet printer and print uh, conductive print circuits onto, say, a piece of plastic. Uh, this is Rick McCullough's group. Rick was the dean when I was at Carnegie Mellon. We have a little bit of collaboration on these things. Uh, supposedly, they have an inkjet printable photoactive polymer that's intended to be used for organic photovoltaics. This is stuff that is going to be, I think, more and more useful, more and more accessible within the next three to four years. So if you wanted to start a project printing your own you know, circuits on a piece of plastic that you can roll up, this is probably going to be the place to start. So for a short-term maker-type project, this is probably where to go. Now, of course, these things are not going to be super cheap, if I was really, really, <laughs> I, I might, if you really had a good, clever idea and could write up a little, you know, two-page white paper about it, I could probably talk to Rick about seeing if we can get some samples. Mm -hmm. But could, uh, I don't know about that. Could this be done on, uh, uh, basically, uh, you know, these, uh, the plastic that, uh, uh, what did I, Tyvek type plastic? You know, which is HDP something. High density polyethylene. Yeah. I don't know. We have yeah. to try. I don't. I don't know. Can, the answer can you to that print question. this stuff on that? I don't know the answer to that. Okay. We'd have to try and see. It's my understanding that a lot of the times when, when I've heard about them doing printed electronics, they're doing it on like transparency sheets mm. for like overhead. That's acetate. Yeah. Is this? Yeah. Or just conductive mm -hmm. ink, or is it uh, uh, semiconductor? As I think that they sell both doped and undoped semiconducting ink. So the doped semiconducting ink, that's that's the stuff that's really dark black, and that's that works basically like a like a metal. And the other one would be would light be, sensitive. Would be the un, the undoped kind, and that works more like a semiconductor. Undoped would work like a silicon. Yes, just like undoped silicon. Okay. Okay. So they, they have like P-type and N-type type, type um, semiconducting polymers. P 
p-type and n-type semiconducting polymers have been made. I don't know whether Plextronics specifically sells both type. I know that the n-type semiconductors <coughs> are, it's harder to make a plastic act like an n-type semiconductor. We'll talk a little bit more about that later when we talk about building photovoltaics out of p-type and n-type devices. But p-type, definitely. So you, I mean, you don't do like diodes and transistors with this. This is just like to draw the lines connecting. You don't, you don't make diodes and transistors with these just yet. But we're gonna, we're gonna talk about other places where conductive polymers are used in diodes and transistors with photocells. Next slide. Uh, one place that these things are used a lot is in cell phone displays to make uh, light emitting diodes. Uh, basically, we, we mentioned that semiconductors can absorb photons with energies greater than the band depth to create an electron hole pair. Well, of course, if you pump electrons and positive charges into the semiconductor, you can get light out. And so there's um, organic light emitting diodes, OLEDs, are used all over the place. I think this projector probably has some effect. And there's the polymer versions of those are just starting to come online. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. So if you care about, uh, one of the things that I think is neat is how these things work. So here's a, met here's a metal electrode, here's a metal electrode, here's a semiconductor, it's got these forbidden bands. Next slide, please. You hook this thing up to an electric circuit, inject an electrode on the left, or electron on the left, positive charge on the right. Next slide. Those go into the material and then recombine. Next slide. To get light out. So electricity goes in, light comes out. Next slide. Uh, polymer organic light emitting diodes are still in the early stages, but these things are made from small molecule dyes and they're used all over the place. And there's problems with degradation. The nice part is if you're an organic chemist, you can do chemistry to change the what side groups you have bound to your dye and that changes the band gap, changes the color. So that's another place where these things are actually used. Next slide. Uh, and the, the last one, this is what I spend a lot of my days thinking about, is making plastic solar cells. Next slide. So, here I actually like talking about the basic physics behind this because it's a really important sort of problem. And if, you know, for example, if you want to do makerspace, hackerspace type work on Saving the world, for example. <laughs> if you want a project like that, this might be an interesting place to go. So, uh, the sun irradiates Earth with about 10 to the third watts per meter squared of energy. Most of that's in the visible spectrum. A human's average power consumption is about 8 times 10 to the 12th watts. So, if we assume 20% power conversion efficiency, which is modest but not bad, building in a factor of 4 increase in power consumption, we work through the details and say, how much, so, how much space do we need to cover with solar panels to run human society? Well, it works out to be 160,000 kilometers squared, which is about five times the size of the Metroplex. So, with today's technology, we could run the entire world on solar energy by covering West Texas with solar panels. Next slide, please. Now the problem is the home solar panels that you look at online are <laughs> more <laughs> So we could do it. It's not cheap. Um, satisfying all the world's energy needs with solar power will require technological improvements. Which is, yes. Uh, no, sorry. I was just pointing. Never no. mind. Okay. okay. <laughs> so, so one of my. It's like an auction. Yeah. <laughs> Your hands down. Sorry. <laughs> so, 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 so one of the reasons friends. why I get up every morning and go to work and spend all my time in the office rather than coming to the makerspace and playing with electronics is that I'm trying to build cheaper solar panels out of these conjugated polymers because if you want to make something cheap, you make it out of plastic, right? Next slide, please. And here's how these things work. Here's another one of these um, cartoons, these energy level diagrams of a slice through device. Now you see this is even simpler than our field effect transistor. It just has a junction between two kinds of poly two kinds of semiconductors. Next slide, please. And if I choose the band gaps of those semiconductors right, I can make it so that this energy difference equals that invisible light. 
optimize n-type semiconductors, they will absorb light, generate these electron hole pairs. Now, if I take just a block of silicon, set it outside, this will happen. And then these will come back and recombine, and all that energy will be lost as heat. The thing will heat up if it sits outside. Though. But if I'm very clever, I know that this excited state, this excited electron, will sort of rattle around in here for a little while before it recombines. And if I build a junction beside it, maybe it'll rattle around and move into this, this kind of material. Next slide, please. Now I've prevented recombination, and I can collect these separate charges in electrodes. Next slide. And that's how a solar panel works. And we have, um, we have these just sitting in the electronics room, where this side is made out of doped silicon. This side is made out of a different silicon with a different dope. Next slide. I had a question about yeah. that. Um, you said that the, the photonic uh, charge uh, would be in the visible light spectrum. Yeah. If it was, let's say, infrared, could that be used almost like to pull electricity from heat? You run into some. You you can't do it 100 percent efficiently. Well, no, you could but do yes, it 100 percent efficiently yes. with normal visual light. So right, yeah. You you have some you have some second laws of thermodynamics that limit how much you can do that. But yes, you can. Okay. One of the hard parts is building a semiconductor that has a band gap in the infrared. Okay. Okay. So next slide. So. Our goal is to say, well, we know we can make different kinds of semiconductors out of plastics. You know, the plastics are cheap to work with. Can we build one of these devices out of it? Next slide. And this is a fun part that, uh, we'll pass on this. Next slide. And pass on this for now. And next one. One more. There. You can actually buy these things. They're not, again, they're not cheap because it's a relatively new technology, but all of these things are starting to come online into consumer products, and this is why this is a good time to start thinking about them. Go back to the previous slide, please, because now we're going to talk about what this thing actually does. So, we have our n-type semiconductors, polyhexyl thiophene, just that conductive polymer that we saw before. The p-type is fullerene, these buckyballs that you may have heard of, people at Rice discovered, because that's a good electron acceptance. That's the best, uh, now I may have got my n-type and p-type confused here, you'll have to excuse me. Yeah, I we think, the, yeah, this is p-type, this is n-type. <laughs> we wouldn't know. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, you can deposit these things from solution, the power conversion efficiencies are two, maybe pushing three to four percent, which means four percent of your incident light energy comes out of the electricity. But, next slide. But these things you can actually make. That way? Yeah. So you can supposedly buy this backpack and it's got a fullerene and conductive polymer solar panel on the back and you can use it to charge your devices. Um, like, is it approach 20% efficiency or not? No, no, these are, these are more of like 2% efficiency. Oh, 2%. Okay. That's, again, why I have a job trying to, trying to improve this, bring that number <laughs> up. What's the peak that? for your, what's the best you can get as far as, not so, is it gallium arsenide or what do they do for the best solar uh, cells you can make out of? If out I remember right, it's pushing 60%. Can we go back three slides? Yeah. Because we had one more, back one more, back one, uh, down two more, sorry, <laughs> down one more, because I have, yeah, there we go. Someone who, it's claiming that you can buy them for 20% efficiency. Uh, I've seen quotes in the literature of much higher than that. One thing to keep in mind is this isn't a heat engine. Carnot's theorem doesn't apply. We don't have the, the usual second law of thermodynamics work converting into heat that you're probably familiar with. But it's pretty good. The, the efficiency is pretty good, except that these things are, as we mentioned, expensive. And I'm trying to work towards making them cheaper. So this, this would be a seemingly longer-term sort of problem. But it's the sort of thing that we're working for, towards. And it's using all of these conductive polymers that hopefully within the next three to four to five years are going to start being more prevalent in consumer products and maybe more widely used by groups like this one. Yes? How much cheaper do you think polymer solar panels could be than uh, polycrystalline uh, silicon solar panels? My hand-waving estimate is that it's as much cheaper as making a device, making any other device out of plastic rather than metal. I'll bite, say. 
mm -hmm. a PVC pipe versus a yeah. filament pipe. Yeah. Now that's that's a wild guess. That's not. I don't have. You know, it hasn't been proven that that's so yet. But we know historically that making things out of plastic is a good strategy for making them cheaper. Well, as long as you have oil. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, not really, because there are some plastics that can be made. Uh, you can you can use just about any feedstock to make plastic, especially if you have good enough. Um, if you have if you're willing to put a little bit of energy into yeah, it. Like so, for example, soy. You, you can uh, Cargill Dow won a big presidential green chemistry challenge award for plastics, polylactic acid plastic that's out on the market now. It's made from corn. Now, uh, the conductive polymer world has not got to the point where they're making so much that they have to be concerned about the feedstock. Those are all made from oil. Oh, so I, I didn't realize um, silicon uh, was up to 20 percent. So you can get 200 watts out of a square meter. Uh, yeah, I think so. Of sun power. Full, Full sun. sun. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But which one did you just mention has gone up to 60? That's, I, if I remember right, I ha and I'd have to look up the reference, but that was something done by the National Renewable Energy Laboratory within the last few years, and that's just the current record. That's the electric leaf methodology that's sort of like a self-contained light activated uh, hy the hydrogen cell, oh, I'm hydrogen sure fuel cell that. kind of chamber thing. I don't know. I don't fully that. understand it, but it was weird. But it's not commercially available. No. 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 Commercially <laughs> available is 20%. As far as I can tell, this, this was when I looked online for the commercial, for things that you could actually buy. This was the highest number that I found. Mm -hmm. but, so that's basically all that I wanted to talk about. So the, the, the take home messages are, one, you can make semiconductors out of plastic. Two, they're starting to be used in commercial devices and commercial inks and things like that. And three, they have a lot of promise for going after some of these long-term problems, although there are still technical challenges that people like me are trying to solve. Actually, can we go down? Next, 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 and then that. Yeah, so this is the sort of thing that I do. These are other conductive polymers that have a piece that donates electrons, a piece that accepts electrons, alternating back and forth. And one more. Here's experimental um, lowest unoccupied energy. So this is the sort of the ionization energy. And here's the calculated one. Here's points for different, um, different kinds of polymers. This is a paper that just came out a couple months ago where I'm working with uh, Mihaela Stefan, who's at UT Dallas, and who makes these things. And we found out that calculations and experiment can do match up pretty well. So we can predict the properties of these things reasonably well. Mm -hmm. And so one of our long-term goals is to be able to use all these computational tools and say, rather than trying to synthesize 10 different <coughs> kinds of polymers, in that time we can do calculations on 10 million. And hopefully we, can hopefully we can at least crudely say, you know, given these 10 million candidates, start by making this particular group of 10. So that's one of the things that we want to try and work on. Mm -hmm. And that's how I got into, got into this game. But that's it. Thanks. Uh, wow. And now I have plenty of time for questions. Yeah, well, I won't put <laughs> yeah. how, how many years do you think it's going to take for this to I mean, 10, 50, 5? Well, mm. I. There's a couple of things that I can say about that. First, I don't know for sure, obviously. <laughs> uh, second, people have been talking about renewable energy for as longer than I've been alive. And there's been a lot of hold-ups and it's it's still not there yet. The three, one of the one of the things that is really promising about the direction the area is going now is that you have this convergence between polymer physics guys, material science guys, and this nanotechnology business. In fact, go up two slides please. Okay. No, no. Okay. Yeah, right here. So the, the, the optimum way to make these devices is to say, well, 
I need to have a large area where my two different kinds of semiconductor, n-type and p-type, fit together. Because I'm only going to get electrons out if my excited electron and hole bump into one of those junctions. Mm -hmm. Chemists have been making those kinds of junctions on a nanoscale for a long time. The way you do it is you make a polymer chain that's one type of polymer that conducts electrons, second type of polymer that conducts holes, the chains are all bound together. If you do that, they pack together very nicely. Next slide. And you get structures, you can get structures that look like this, where here the, the length scale is, I believe it's again about a micron. So this, you just make the polymer, you put it on a surface, and it self-assembles into those neat-looking structures. And by changing the different lengths of the, the, the relative lengths of the two polymer chains, you can get structures that look like this. You can get nice, regular, ordered structures. This is bottom-up nanotechnology. <laughs> and so I think that the, the convergence of polymer physics and nanoscience and things like that has a fighting chance of making these things practical in the next 10 years. I'm not going to give you any promises, but I think we have a fighting chance. I heard a kind of interesting story. This guy wanted to make a colored soap bubble. Ooh. and So he went to the grocery store and he tried every kind of uh, you know, hair dye and every, everything that had color in it. He took it home and made a big mess and nothing, none of it worked. And about two years later, he had the idea, which I thought was a pretty cool, cool insight, to go on to Monster and he talked to some chemists and he had the wording that one needs to ask this question correctly. And he put his Monster post saying, I'm looking for an organic chemist to do this. And he put that out on Monster. Basically, the whole planet had access to mm -hmm. it and he got the expert from India or somebody to call him and it ended up creating a success story. There's a product called Zubles now, which is colored soap <laughs> bubbles. Uh, they hit your skin and they pop and they don't leave any uh, residual. It's a very clever... <laughs> How does it work? <laughs> I don't know. Look up. Google, okay. Google, you didn't know the Google question. Google. The answer is Zubles Zubles. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and you can find out. But as you were talking, I was sitting there thinking, you probably have six of these questions that you wish you knew how to solve. So I think you might think about making monster post and see if your phone rings. <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit lucky in that I get to actually talk to some of these people at conferences. So I was just in uh, big American Chemical Society in Denver, so I got to chat up all of the people who are actually working on polythiophene synthesis. But um, You may already know them. <laughs> yeah. Somebody calls you and you go, oh yeah, I know that guy. <laughs> okay, that's all I have. Well, that's it.